Welcome to Shauname, Book of Kings. Today we continue with the tale of Esfandiar and Rostam. Esfandiar answered, Too much talk is pointless. Our stomachs are empty. The day's half over, and we've said enough about battles. Bring whatever you have to our supper, and don't invite those who talk the whole time. When Rostam began to eat, the others were astonished at his appetite. They sat opposite him, watching him feast. Then Asfendiar gave orders that Rostam be served with red wine, saying, We'll see what he wants when the wine affects him, and he talks about King Kavas. A servant brought old wine in a goblet, and Rostam toasted Goshtasp and drank it off. The boy refilled it with royal vintage, and Rostam said to him quietly, There's no need to dilute it with water. It takes the edge off the old wine. Why do you put water in it? Pashutin said to the serving boy, Bring him a goblet filled with undiluted wine. Wine was brought. Musicians were summoned, and the group watched in wonder as Rostam drank. When it was time for Rostam to return to Zal, Esfandiar said to him, May you live happily and forever. May the food and wine you've consumed here nourish you, and may righteousness sustain your soul. Rostam replied, Prince, may wisdom always be your guide. The wine I've drunk with you has nourished me, and my wise mind wants for nothing. If you can be intelligent enough and man enough to lay aside this desire for combat, come out of the desert to my home and take your ease as my guest. I'll do everything I promised, and I'll give you a good advice. Rest for a while, turn aside from evil, be civil, and come back to your senses. Espendiar replied, Don't sow seeds that will never grow. Tomorrow, when I bind on my sword belt for combat, you'll see what a warrior is. Stop praising yourself. Get back to your palace and prepare yourself for the morning. A battle is as of little account to me as drinking party. But my advice is that you don't try to fight with me. Do what I say. Accept the king's command that you should be bound in chains. And when we go from Zabol to Goshtesp court, you'll see that I'll even be more chivalrous than I have promised. Don't try to cause me any more sorrow. Then grief filled Rostam's heart, and in his sight the world seemed like a wood, the world bereft of light. He thought, either I let him bind my hands, and in so doing bow to his commands, or I must fight against him face to face, and bring on him destruction and disgrace. No good can come of either course, and I shall be despised and cursed until I die. His chains will be the symbol of my shame. Goshtap will kill me and destroy my fame. The world will laugh at me, and men will say, Rostam was hung with chains and led away. A stripling conquered him, and all I've done will be forgotten then by everyone. But if we fight each other and he's slain, I cannot show my face at court again. They'll say I left a fine young prince for dead because of one or two harsh words, he said. And death I'll be reviled. My name will be a byword for disgrace and infamy, and then if I'm to perish at his hands, my clan will lose Zabol, our native land. One thing would still survive, though, since my name would be remembered and not lose its fame. Then he spoke to his haughty companion, saying, Anxiety robs my skin of its color. You talk so much about chains and binding me, and everything you do alarms me. What the heavens will is sovereign over us, and who knows how they will turn. You're following a demon's advice and refusing to listen to reason. You haven't lived many years in this world, and you don't know how deceptive and evil it is, my prince. You're a simple, straightforward man, and you know nothing about life. You should realize that evil men are trying to destroy you. Gosh Tasp will never tire of his crown and throne, and he will drive you throughout the world. Make your face every every danger to keep you away from them. In his mind, he searched the world, his intelligence hacking away like an axe to find some hero who would not refuse to fight with you, so that such a man would destroy you and the crown and throne would remain his. You blame my motives, but why don't you examine your own heart? Prince, don't act like some thoughtless youth. Don't persist in this disastrous course. Be ashamed before God and before my face. Don't betray yourself, and don't think that combat will, with me would be a game. 
If fate has driven you and your men here, you will be destroyed by me. I shall leave an evil name behind me in the world, and may the same fate be Gosh Taps. Esfandiar replied, Great Rostam, think of what a wise sage once said. A man and his dotage is a fool, no matter how wise or victorious or knowledgeable he's been. You want to trick me and slip out of this. You want to convince people by your smooth talk, so that they'll say Rostam welcomed him warmly and called you a wise, benevolent man, while they'll say that I was unrighteous, I who always act from righteous motives. You want to say the prince refused to listen to me so that he had no choice but to fight. All his pleas were treated with contempt, and bitter words passed between them. But I shall not swerve aside from the king's commands. Not for the crown itself, all the good and evil of the world I find in him, and in him lie both heaven and hell. May what you've eaten here nourish you and confound your enemies. Now go home and tell Zal everything you have seen here. Prepare your armor for battle and bandy no more words with me. Come back at dawn ready to fight, and don't draw this business out any further. Tomorrow... On the battlefield, you'll see the world grow dark before your eyes. You'll see what combat with a real warrior is. Rostam replied, If this is what you want, I'll return your hospi t hospitality with racks hoofs, and my mace will be my medicine for your head. You've listened to your court telling you that no one can match his sword against S. Vandiar, but tomorrow you'll see me grasping Rack's reins, and my lance, couched, and after that you'll never look to fight again. The young man's lips broke into a bewitching laughter, and he said, For a fighting man, you've let our conversation anger you too easily. Tomorrow, tomorrow, you'll see how a man fights on the battlefield. I'm no mountain, and my horse beneath me is no mountain either. I'm one man like any other. If you run from me with your head still on your shoulders, your mother will weep for your humiliation. And if you're killed, I'll tie you to my saddle and bear you off to the king, so that no vassal of his will ever challenge him again. When Rostam left Esfandiar's pavilion, he paused for a moment and spoke to it. O oh, tent of hope! What glorious days you've known! Once you were sheltered to great Jamshid's throne— in you, Kosrovs and King Kavas' days were passed in splendor, pageantry, and praise. Closed is that glorious gate that once you knew. A man unworthy of you reigns in you. S.V. Andiar heard him, planted himself in front of Rostam, and said, Why should you speak to our pavilion so intemperately? This Zaspid <coughs> Zabalastin of yours should be called Laut Esten because when a guest has eaten his fill here, he starts loudishly insulting his host. Then he too addressed the royal tent. You sheltered Jamshed once, who erred and strayed, who heard God's heavenly laws and disobeyed. Then came Cavus, whose blasphemous desires sought to control the sky's celestial fires. Tumult and plunder, plots, perfidy, pain, filled all the land throughout his wretched reign. But now... Your walls encompass King Goshtasp, who rules his wise counselor Jamasp. The prophet Zoraster, who brought heaven's scriptures to us, shares his noble court. Good Pashutan is here, and so am I. His prince watched over by fuming sky, protector of the good, scourge of the horde of evildoers who bow before my sword. When Rassam had left, Esfandiar turned to Pap. Pa shootin and said, There's no hiding such heroism. I've never seen such a horseman, and I don't know what will happen tomorrow on the battlefield. When he comes armored to battle, he must be like a raging elephant, his stature a marvel to gaze upon. Nevertheless, I fear that tomorrow he will face defeat. My heart aches for his kindness and glory, but I can't evade God's command tomorrow when he faces me in combat. I'll turn his shining days to darkness. But Shutin replied, Listen to what I have to say. Brother, do not do this. I have said it before, and I will say it again, because I will not wash my hands of what is right. Don't harry him like this. A free man will never willingly submit to another's tyranny. Sleep tonight, and when dawn comes, we'll go to his castles without an escort, and there will be his guests and answer his every anxiety. 
Everything he has done in the world has been for the good, benefiting the nobility and the general populace alike. I won't refuse your orders. I can see that he'll be loyal to you. How long are you going to go on with all this rage and anger and malice? Drive them out of your heart. Esfandiar answered him. Thorns have appeared among the roses. Then a man of pure faith shouldn't talk as you're doing. You're the first counselor to Persia's king, the heart, eyes, and ears of its chieftains, and yet you think it right and wise to disobey the king like this? Then all my pains and struggles were pointless, and Zoroaster's faith to be forgotten, because he has said that hell will be the home of whoever turns against it, aside from his king's command. How long are you going to tell me to disobey Goshtesp? You can say this. How can I agree to it? If you're afraid for my life, I'll rid you of this fear today. No man ever died except at his appointed time, and a man whose reputation lives on never dies. Tomorrow you'll see how I'll fight against the fearsome war, nor. Pashutin said, And for how long are you going to talk about fighting? Since you first took up arms, Iblis has had no control over your thoughts, but now you're opening your heart to demons and refusing to hear good advice. How can I drive from my heart when I see that two great warriors, two lions in battle, are to face one another, and what will come of this is all unknown? The hero made no answer. His heart was filled with pain, and a sigh escaped his lips. By the time Rostam reached his castle, he could see no remedy but warfare. Zavare came out to greet him and saw his pallor, and that his heart was filled with darkness. Rostam said to him, Prepare my Indian sword, my lance and helmet, my bow and the barding for Raksh. Bring me my tiger skin and my heavy mace. Zavare had the steward bring what Rostam had asked for, and when Rostam saw his weapons and armor, he heaved a cold sigh and said, My armor, for a while you've been at peace, and now this indolence of yours must cease. A hard fight lies ahead, and I shall need all the luck that you bring me to succeed. Two warriors who have never known defeat, like two enraged and roaring tigers, will meet. And in the struggle on the battlefield, who knows what tricks he'll try to make me yield. When Zal heard what Rostam had happened, his aged mind was troubled. He said, what are you telling me? You're filling my mind with darkness. Since first you sat in the saddle, you've been a chivalrous and righteous warrior, proud to serve your kings and contemptuous of hardships. But I fear your days are drawing to an end, that your lucky stars are in decline, and the seed of Zal will be eradicated from this land, and our women and children hurled to the ground as slaves. If you're killed in combat by a young stripling like Esvandiar, Zabalestin will be laid waste, and all our glory will be razed and cast into a pit. And if he's hurt in this encounter, your good name will be destroyed. Everyone will tell the tale of how you killed a young prince because of a few harsh words, he said. Go to him. Stand before him as his subject. And if you can't do that, then leave. Go and hide yourself in some corner where no one will hear of you. You can buy the world with treasures and trouble, but you can't cut Chinese silk with an axe. Give his retinue robes of honor. Get back your independence with gifts. When he leaves the banks of Hermond, saddle Raksh and go with him as you travel to the court. Swear fealty to him, and when Goshtap sees you, there's no danger he'll harm you, and it would be an act of unworthiness of a monarch. Rostam replied, Old man, don't take what I've said so lightly. I fought for years, and I've experienced the world's good and evil. I've encountered the demons of Mazandran and the horsemen of Hamaviran. I fought against Kamas and the Emperor of China, whose armies were so mighty that the earth trembled beneath the horses' hoofs. But now, if I flee from Esfandiar, there will be no castles or gardens for you in Zabalestin. I may be old, but when I put on my tiger skin for battle, it makes no difference whether I face a hundred maddened elephants or a plain filled with warriors. I've done all that you're asked me to. I read the book of loyalty to him. He treats my words with contempt and ignores my wisdom and advice. If he could bring his head down from the heavens and welcome me in his heart, there's no wealth in my treasury, nor weapon or armor that I wouldn't give him. 
but he took no notice of all my talk and left me empty-handed. If I were to fight tomorrow, you would despair of his life. But I won't take my sharp sword in hand. I'll bear him off to a banquet. You'll see no mace or lance from me, and I won't oppose him man to man. I'll simply lift him from the saddle and acknowledge him as king in Goshtab's place. I'll bring him here and seat him on an ivory throne, load him with presents, keep him as my guest for three days, and on the fourth day when the sun's red ruby splits the darkness, I'll set off with him to Goshtab's corp, when I enthrone him and crown him. I'll stand before him as his loyal subject, concerned only for Esvandiar's commands. You remember how I acted with Kobad? And you know how it... It's my quarrelsome, passionate nature that's made my reputation in the world. And now you're telling me either to run off and hide or submit to his chains? Sal broke out into laughter, shaking his head in wonder at his son's words. He said, don't say such things. Even demons couldn't put up with such foolish talk. You chatter about what we did with Kobad. But he was living obscurely in the mountains then. He wasn't a great king, with a throne, a crown, treasure, and cash at his disposal. You're about Esvandiar, who counts the emperor of China among his subjects. And you say you'll lift him from his saddle and bear him off to Zal's palace? An old, experienced man doesn't talk like this. Don't court bad luck by setting yourself up as the Persian king's equal. You're the best of all our chieftains. But I've given you my advice, and may you follow it. Having spoken, he bent his forehead to the ground in prayer. Just judge, I pray you, to preserve us from an evil fate. And so he prayed throughout the night, his tongue untiring until the sun rose above the mountains. When day broke, Rostam put on his mail and tiger skin, hitched his lariat to his saddle, and mounted Raksh. He summoned Zaver and told him to have the army's ranks drawn up in the foothills. Zavare saw that this was done, and Rostam couched his lance and rode out from the palace. His soldiers called out encouragement as he went forward, followed by Zavare, who was acting as his lieutenant. Privately, Rostam said to him, Somehow I'll put paid to this evil devil's spawn and get my soul back in the light again. But I fear I shall have to harm him, and I don't know what good can come of all this. You stay with our troops, while I go to see what fate has in store for me. If I find he's still the same hothead, spoiling for a fight, let me face him alone. I don't want any of our warriors hurt in this. Victory favors the just. He crossed the river and began to climb the opposite bank and wondered if the world's ways filled his mind. He faced Esfandiar and shouted, your enemy has come. Prepare yourself. And as Vandiar heard the old lion's words, he laughed and shouted back, I've been prepared since I woke. He gave orders that his armor, helmet, lance, and mace be brought. And when he was accoutred, he had his black horse saddle and brought before him. Then, glorying in his strength and agility, he thrust his lance point into the ground, and the leopard, leaping on a wild ass and striking terror into its heart, he vaulted into the saddle. The soldiers were delighted and roared with approval. Esfandier rode toward Rostam, and when he saw his opponent had come alone, he turned to Pashutin and said, I need no companion in this. He is alone, and I shall be too. We'll move off to higher ground. Pashutin withdrew to where the Persian soldiers waited, and the two combatants went forward to battle as grimly as if all pleasure had been driven from the world. When the old man and his young opponent faced each other, both their horses neighed violently, and the noise was as though the ground beneath them split open. Rostam's voice was serious when he spoke. Young man, your fortune's favorite, and your heart's filled with the joys of youth. Don't go forward with this. Don't give yourself up to anger. For once, listen to wisdom's words. If you're set on bloodshed, say so and I'll have my Zaboli warriors come here, and you can send Persians against them, and the two groups can show their mettle. We'll watch from the sidelines, and your desire for blood and combat will be satisfied. Esfandiar answered him, How long are you going to go on with this pointless talk? You got up at dawn and summoned me to this hillside. Was that simply deception? Or is it that you now you foresee your own defeat? What could a battle between your warriors of mine mean to me? 
God forbid I should a agree to send my Persians into battle while I held back and crowned myself king. For a man of my faith, such an act would be contemptible. I lead my warriors into battle, and I am first to face the foe, even as leopard. If you need companions to fight with you, summon them, but I shall never call on anyone's aid. God is my companion in battle, and good fortune smiles on me. You're looking for a fight, and I'm ready for one. Let's face each other man to man without our armies, and let's see whether Esfandiar's horse returns riderless to a stable, or Rostam turns masterless towards his palace. They swore that no one would come to their aid while they fought. Again and again they rode against one another with couched lances. Blood poured from their armor, and their lances' heads were shattered, so that the combatants were forced to draw their swords. Weaving and dodging to the right and to the left, they attacked one another. Their horses' maneuver flung them against one another with such violence that their swords, too, were shattered. They drew their maces then, and the blows they dealt resounded like a blacksmith's hammer striking still. Their bodies wounded and exhausted. They fought like enraged lions until the handles of their maces splintered. Then they leapt forward and grasped each other by the belt each struggling to throw the other, while their horses reared and pranced. But though they strained against one another, exerting all their strength and massive weight, neither warrior shifted from the saddle. And so they separated, sick at heart, their mouths smeared with dust and blood, their armor and barding dented and pierced, their horses wearied by their struggle. When the combat was gone on for some time, Zavare grew impatient of the delay and shouted to the Persian soldiers, Where is Rostam? Why should we hang back on a day like this? You came to fight against Rostam, but you're never going to be able to bind his hands, and we won't sit here while a battle's going on. And then he began cursing his opponents. And S.V. Andiar's son, Nuzhaz, was a fiery, ambitious youth, was enraged at the insults this provincial from Sistan was heaping upon them, and responded in kind, Is it right for a noble warrior to make fun of a king's command? Our leader, Esfandiar, gave us no orders to fight with dogs like you, and who would ignore or override his wishes? But if you want to challenge us, you'll see how real warriors can fight with swords and spears and maces. In response... And Zavare gave the signal for Sistan's war cry to ring out, and for the men to attack. He himself rushed forward from the rear of his troops, and the tumultuous noise of fighting began. Countless Persians were slaughtered, and when Nuzar saw that this, he mounted his horse, grasped his Indian sword in his hand, and headed for the fray. Among the Sistani troops, one of the best warriors was a wild tamer of horses, a main man named Alvad, who was Rostam's spear bearer and always accompanied him into battle. Nushazar caught sight of him, wheeled toward him, and struck him with a mighty blow with his sword. His head was severed, and his body slid lifeless from its saddle into the dirt. Zavare urged his horse forward and called out, You've laid him low, but stand your ground and fight, because Alvarad is not what I'd call a horseman. With that, Zavare flung his lance, which pierced Nushazar's chest, and a moment later, the Persian warrior's head lay in the dirt. And here's where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends.